Hi, Will. Hi, Sandy. The little red dot is flashing, so it is time for me to say good evening and welcome oh, yeah. to this week's installment of Speaking of Seeing, Family Ties. Where you are in the dark, in the warm country of England, and I am cold on the roof in New York City. Mm, your choice. Just Says a lot right there. <laughs> Well, family ties, it's something that we've actually skirted around before and we've certainly talked off camera a lot about um, our families and through the process, I think, of building a friendship and getting to know each other. It is interesting getting a grip on where somebody comes from, like what they come from. Um, certainly I feel that. I know that I've always enjoyed seeing photographs of my friends uh, when they were children way before I may have known them, for example. Are you the same? Uh, yeah, well, I think it's, it's, it's always telling because my theory is that people don't really change from sort of puberty on. And then any changes that do occur are generally fairly superficial. And if you dig deep enough, you're going to get back to the kid who was 13 or 15. Um, so I find it fascinating in that way, because I think it's, it can tell you a lot about a person when you see pictures of them when they were young or a teenager in college, because it's like, oh, okay. Now I see what the real them inside of them is. It's it's that person with, you know, peroxide blonde cropped hair, you know, that kind of thing. It's cute. Mm. But do you think the photograph, you know, very big question for, you know, the very first slide this evening is, that, you know, are the photographs truthful? Well, I mean, I, the thing that I found interesting about you even asking to do uh, the family photos idea was that you know both of us have so much baggage with any image of anybody in our family you know what i mean everything about that person or their family or how they feel about it or all of it all of it's wrapped up in this image where the other person is just looking at you know three people after dinner on the street and a snapshots taken of them and they don't have all of that so the question is will they be able to read into it the same way read into the reality or is it just going to be superficial from the other person's point of view. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, God, is there truth in photography? No, I guess is the answer. And then the other answer is yes, absolutely. Um, I think the, the thing about photography in general is that you take something that's three dimensional and you make it two dimensional. And I think that that is in many ways true from a more complicated and emotional perspective as well. So in the UK at the moment, um, much as galleries are closed because of uh, the pandemic, uh, we still have access to the National Portrait Gallery, the virtual exhibition of the Taylor Weston uh, Photographic Portrait Prize. It runs every year. The prize has been running for 26 years, I think. Um, and all week this week in, in online school, I've been taking classes to the virtual exhibition to have a look around all the photographs. And this photograph is one um, that has stood out. It's actually one of the prize winners. So the photographs that are in the exhibition more widely are um, shortlisted from well over 5,000 entries, international entries from all around the world. Um, it's a really prestigious prize. I would recommend anyone listening, if you are interested in photographic portraiture, to go and visit that virtual exhibition. I think it's an amazing resource to have access to an entire exhibition virtually for free. Um, but anyway, this, this image is in the top three. It's by Lydia Goldblatt. She's a, uh, I think she's got a master's from somewhere like Goldsmiths in London. She's um, had solo shows. She's an established photographer, um, although truthfully, I'd never heard of her before this exhibition. Um, and the photograph that the judges selected uh, was actually from a series called Fugue. Um, and the title of this particular photograph is Eden. And that's because the photograph is of Eden, and Eden is Lydia Goldblatt's daughter. Um, I know, Bill, you haven't seen this photograph before, and um, the reason why also I've put in this evening's presentation is that it seems rather rudimentary just to say, well, it's a photograph taken by a mother of a child 
it's a, a family photograph in as much as it could be a photograph we happen upon in somebody's family album. But I think there are lots of things to do with the, the wider title of Fugue, or that kind of musical reference, um, but also the series content. There's lots of information. The Taylor Wesson Prize, by the way, is an excellent exhibition in terms of having lots of contextual knowledge available. So every single photograph on display has got not just a title or an artist's name, but um, also uh, you know an extended blurb, I suppose, about you know what what what's going on, who the person is, and so on. And the series fugue starts with Lydia Goldblatt scattering the ashes of her mother, who's just passed away. This is right at the start of the COVID pandemic. And the series traces her very limited family life in these, um, I guess, snapshot moments. It could be very familiar to lots of us, and yet Eden, much as it's the name of her child, beautiful garden full of everything you could ever want, yet so kind of terribly sort of snatched away from us. Somehow there's definitely something in how the work's titled that leads me to a maybe a darker sense. Do you, do you think she, she, she named her daughter Eden just so she could do a photo series about her seven years later? Of course. <laughs> Let me ask you a question right off the cuff. Do you see it as Eden wants to be in there or do you see it as Eden was put in there? Oh, I think Eden wants to be in there, but I think it's a happy accident that it also lends itself to probably what the photographer wants. Eden wants to be, it's, you know, it's funny, your, your whole discussion about the concept of Eden and garden and all the bit and all the rest. And you look at this child inside a plastic box outside in this beautiful, instead of just sitting on the ground on a blanket, she's inside a plastic box on the ground on a blanket in what seems to be a very lovely backyard. Yeah, but you know, that's why photographs like this, you were saying before about how uh, maybe the other person will look at a family photograph. Um, and, you know, in our series coming up that are from our personal family albums, uh, the other one of us might not get the, the references, we might not understand the inferences. And we the symbolism. We won't yeah. know the, the deeper issues that yeah. are within each image. And likewise with this, though this is a, a what I think of as a formal portrait, and it's also now going to be a very widely known portrait, um, nonetheless, you know, what are the subtexts and how many layers are there to the meaning in this particular piece? And, and by the way, I would just like to say that it's also always the case I find with my own child is you can give them a giant backyard but they'll only want to stand in about a centimeter of it they don't sure. necessarily want to go and leap about in the sun they want to go and stand in the cardboard box always you know there's this it's not contrariness on the part of the child it's just a different kind of inquisitiveness that we perhaps don't remember I think it's also a, a, a desire to sort of contain or have power over oneself, you know? It's, yes, they're in one centimeter, but they're in the one centimeter that they choose today, and it might be a different one centimeter tomorrow. Yeah. But because I, of that, and looking at this photograph in context then of speaking about family ties, I do wonder in portraiture how easy or hard it is to claim that a photograph of a family member taken by maybe either one of us or by our parents could ever actually be a portrait? Like, what is it really a portrait of? Or who is it a portrait of? I also have very, not strong feelings, but I'm always on guard when I see a somebody who is a portrait photographer by trade taking photographs of their own family. There's always the question in my head of how contrived it all is or isn't. You know, is this a snapshot or is this very specifically put together, you know, and even if it is a snapshot, you know, how many frames did they take? Did he, did she tell her to turn a little bit to the left? You know what I mean? Like how much is it reality and how much is it created? Because we, I think we make assumptions when it comes to most photographs of family that they are something akin to snapshots, you know, that they are a moment in time. 
so this is also then a much bigger question for us to think about is whether photographs that are of family could actually be classed as photographs proper. Yeah, whether there's something less than or yeah, more than. Uh, you know, we could talk about all the greats of photography. You and I spent a lot of time talking about very established, really important so-called photographers. Mm, yeah. What elevates or diminishes a photograph to status of photograph with a capital P? Um, and when it is when it is of our own family, for example, does it somehow become disqualified from the greater history of photography with a capital P? Because it is yeah. uh, something of, of familiarity. And does that familiarity breed contempt, not just from us as photographer slash viewer family member, but more, but more widely that, you know, we, we might look at Sally Mang's work and, and really kind of question this. Yeah, it's funny. Whenever I hear any interview, I think she, Sally Mann was on Fresh Air, which is a big NPR show here in America. And and the host, you know, she's talked about the stuff with her kids in 1980s, early 80s, like a thousand times. And, you know, all the stuff about sexualization and blah, 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 blah. And you could tell that she feels that she's answered every question she could possibly tell about those family photos. Those are good examples, though, of something that were, yes, it's just her kids running around a thing, but you don't take large format eight by 10 photographs of your kids as snapshots. You know what I mean? Like yeah, those are. Hang on, Bill, though. Maybe you do if you're lucky enough to own a large format camera. You know, I own a large format camera and it takes a long time to take a single picture. <laughs> no, but my point would be is that there's, there's, uh, there are, again, many issues in, in terms of how we name and label photographs as what they sure. are. And, you know, if Sally Mann hadn't happened to have that large format camera, would she in actual fact still have been shooting the same kinds of photographs? No, she would have taken very different photographs. But that's almost my point is that the, 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 the I don't want to get on a Sally Mann tangent because that's a whole other show. Uh, the, the, you know, she took those pictures with that camera in that way because, yes, she was a person there with that camera. But I think just inherently going along with a process like the one that she has to use in order to do those kinds of photographs inherently changes the people in front of the camera in a way that picking up a phone and going click does not it just does i mean being in front of a box that is you know one foot cubed is is a completely different experience than than just getting shot with a little tiny handheld camera um but 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 my, my in context to the gold black photograph on the screen then yeah does it make a difference to you that you don't know the camera it's been shot with uh no but if i did know the camera it was being shot with it would tell me a lot more about the photograph mm. Bill, what there's just perspective? well i i think that there's inherently something about that you know if you're driving a motor scooter or you're driving a Mack truck, it tells you something about what you're taking from place to place. You know, those things, those things do, they do change it. I mean, I know you don't like the technical, having the technical side of things, having an effect on the art side of things, but a, a lot of times they do, or at least they, they do in my experience and the experience of those that I generally talk to. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm always I'm always suspicious about pictures like this. Okay, so by the way, the fact that the little girl is in fact sitting in that strange tent, we can't really get purchase on her in quite the same way as viewers that we otherwise yeah. might if she were just sitting in the world. Is there any purpose to that? What is that about, do you think? The tent? Mm. I mean, well, I mean, there's, there's uh, nowadays when it comes to COVID, yeah, there's like, there's an isolation aspect of it. There's a, people like to be contained. I, the, you know, the other day, uh, you know, I, I don't know if I've mentioned on the show before, but uh, my wife live and I live in like one big open space and she's working all the time. And I've been working on a screenplay and I've needed space to do this. 
and I haven't found any. And I ended up moving some stuff out of this big walk-in closet we have. And I pushed one of our living room chairs in there. And I put in foam earplugs and noise canceling headphones the other day. And I walked in and I closed the door and I was in my own space and I was able to write and it was glorious. But there was something about just sort of being, it's almost like being swaddled kind of, you know what I mean? To, to be contained a little bit. So, you know, and kids always like things they can go inside of. But then again, maybe, you know, maybe this kid's really allergic to, you know, some kind of insect or something and has to be inside the thing in her backyard. You know, we don't know. Maybe. I'm going to just read something, though, that's a quote. Go ahead. Black. She said, in such close, sometimes blissful, sometimes painful proximity to my children, I am more aware of all that remains unknown between us. Or I Some stuff. All that remains unknown between us. I think that's I mean that, an extraordinary thing to say about one's own child. It's maybe kind of brave to say those sorts of things about. Well, it is, and I mean, I think you, can, in some ways, you can speak to it more because you, you know, have children. I, I, it's. There was a time in my life where I would think a statement like that felt. It's the term we used to use on uh, taking pictures, uh, full of art school pretense. But, but, but now when I hear that, that statement, it actually not only rings true, but it rings in my head. I say, well, of course that's true. Eden is a different person than Lydia. There's going to be things that are impossible to know about one another. And that's kind of what makes them individuals. And that's not only okay, that's good. Do you think when you're making portraits, Bill, do you ever really know, get to know your subject? I think I do in the room. I don't think that it, I don't think that it's ever translated on in the final image. What do you mean by that? Um, if I have time to take pictures of somebody and it's just the two of us, and we can talk, uh, it ends up being very much like a therapy session with a camera. And it can, a lot of times, layers get taken away to where I feel like I know the person better than some of their closest friends may know them because I am, I have no skin in the game. You know what I mean? They can talk to me in a way that they couldn't talk to their parents or their spouse or whatever it is. And so there are times in those situations, especially at night, it's very strange when, when, when it's dark, people change the way they think. And I think that there are moments of clarity where I feel like I have a very good sense of who they are. And I hope that, I mean, those are the, those are sort of the moments when, you know, you take a picture and you feel like it does something. But again, like I said, in the beginning, the whole 3d to 2d concept, it's like what, what, whatever, whatever that reality is, it collapses down to a flat surface. So I think inherently in photography, you don't get all of the complexities. You just get w one surface of them. Um, but sometimes that's enough. Was this not the first one or was this the first one? I forget when, when you flipped through them earlier. This is the first one in the series of your family album. Hmm. So this is the most recent of the photographs, I think, you think, right? Uh, yes. Uh, well, uh, Yes, it is. Um, yeah, this is my this is my father on the left and me on the right. These actually these photographs were taken seven years apart. Uh, in two thousand four, my father and I went on a trip. You ever read Zen in the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance? <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean, but I haven't read it. Oh, you should read it. It's a good book. And uh, my father and I never had a well. I don't want to get too deep into it because I will, I'm going to spoil it for later. But uh, my father and I had a standoffish relationship for much of my life. Uh, and I gave him a copy of that book because I really liked it when I read it. And he actually read it. My father was not a reader. And he said, you know, you and I should go on a trip. And I was like, where do you want to go? And we ended up some crazy person on the internet in 2004 
figured out the route that they took on all the back roads all the way from the middle of the country all the way out to the California coast. And my father and I drove those roads all the way out to the California coast and then down and around and through Yosemite. And this is in Yosemite in one of the Sequoia groves. And uh, we spent two weeks together and my father had stopped drinking because he had uh, pancreatitis, which it turns out was pancreatic cancer, which killed him uh, about 14 months after this picture was taken. Um, and so this is a picture I took of him through this tunnel tree. And when I went back there with my wife, years later, uh, I wanted to get myself in the same position. So I did, although my hair is terrible in that picture. But um, yeah, it's weird. Do you identify with your parents? Do you see yourself as in any way a diminutive version of them or a sort of a copy of them? I don't think there's a straight answer to give to that, really. Well, I could. Yeah circumnavigate it and we are also going to talk about that kind of idea I think as we go along really because I do wonder about who I wonder about who I am in that I know who I am I'm self-aware I'm pretty self-confident however where where have I been um there's a really really kind of big question I think to do with, it maybe sounds too obscure, but before I was born, where was Deep. I? <laughs> no, but you know, this <laughs> idea that we come from this void. Yeah, uh, but that before me, the people that had made me up were there. Yeah. And then before them, of course, the people that made them up and so on, back to the the, the tunnel of time that I often like to refer to, but I always find that really interesting, very sobering, actually. Do you find it comforting or do you find it uh, unsettling? I can see why it is comforting. But I think there's a great danger in seeking comfort from it. And that's also to do with relationship with truth and memory, I think. Um, I also think that, I mean, to go back to the last photograph, the fugue photograph, I mean, there is this idea that, you know, we're, we're, we're born, we live, we have children, we die, and then the children just repeat that. And we're just stuck in this loop, right? That's continually changing versions of the same theme, variations on the same theme. But is that I, what you've been doing here? In this photograph, you mean? Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. But, but, but in the same way, I spent the first, I don't know, 40, 30 something years of my life trying to not be my father in many ways. Like I, if anything, I wasn't, I wasn't trying to be my father. I wasn't trying to be me. I was trying to be the opposite of what he was. You know what I mean? I was trying to be the anti my father. Um, part of it, it has to do with the fact that I am William George Wadman Jr. The guy on the left is William George Wadman. I am by definition, a diminutive version of my father, you know, by name. Um, do you resent that? Yeah, I would ne if I ever had a child, I would never name my child the same as me. Hmm. I think that there's all kinds of stuff that goes along with that. Well, I mean, I'm Sandy. And yeah, my dad is Alexander. Uh, and Sandy is a kind of pet version of Alexander. Yeah. Uh, and my dad's dad was Alexander. And my dad's dad, dad was Alexander, you know, this kind of goes again, yeah. the idea of like going back through generations I, I always find it interesting there's lots of stuff again you can look it up there's a i think it's a, a brothers who do this they kind of repose themselves sure yeah i know this of them from when they were children and yep. um, i think it's kind of at first it's cute and then it becomes quite creepy and disconcerting yep there's a sense we try to return somehow to who we think we are and where we do you, come from, but I'm not sure we can ever do that. Or if in fact, it's particularly, maybe it's healthy to look at it, but not to do it or try and be it or live it. Well, in, even in, even in this case of this photograph, I don't see this. I mean, yes, it's me further down my timeline, standing in the same place my father was standing, right? Like that's, that's a reality. Mm -hmm. But 
I see this in some ways as you ever, there are there things that you ever wanted to do because they, you need to do them because they need to bookend something else. I need to go back to this place just so I've been back there. So now the other time I was there, so, th so that, that place or that moment is mine now, as opposed to theirs or ours. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Yeah. Um, I think, so, I think I mean, that is very true also once somebody has died, isn't it? That we perhaps seek to, some people are terrified of returning to rooms or houses, for example, childhood homes when yeah. parents have died. Because yeah. there's a terror in a kind of slightly, um, maybe the, the opposite way, there's a terror that the essence of that memory will be lost through the revisiting of it. Well, I mean, there's a reality to the idea that the more you recall a memory, the more it changes, right? Mm. That's like, that's like a true psychological thing that they've shown. I think that so in some ways, the more you remember somebody, the more the less they are how you remember them. Well, the alternative title for this was going to be memory. Yeah. And um, because I think everything we're going to show is really about our perception of memory. And just to go back to our first image again, the idea of memory with this even, you know, why do we take photographs of each other anyway? Why do parents rush at their children to record every single moment? Do they honestly think that somehow the life is lost if it's not captured? I, 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 have, I, I have very strong feelings about, I mean, I think nowadays when people are taking 30 pictures of their kid a day on their phone, mm. that it's actually in some ways less valuable than if you took five pictures a year at somebody's birthday party and at Christmas and whatever. Um, it just it, like that it's, you, you need to find some place between no photos at all and so many photos that you actually never made a decision of how you want to remember this age or this time. Right. Um, but there's also a sense, I guess, that if you're so busy taking your photographs, you're not there experiencing the moment. You know, Harry, yeah. that, that's just giving yourself a layer or a, yeah. a barrier, isn't it? Again, this idea. I, I, I don't travel with like I, if I trap like our our honeymoon. I brought my phone, mm -hmm. like that was my only camera. When we went to Japan, I brought a Hasselblad and like ten rolls of film, so I took like ten pictures a day. <laughs> you know, I didn't. I didn't. Um, I'm I'm very much aware of the carrying around a camera and worrying about the picture you're taking getting in the way of you living the moment and understanding and experiencing it in this in the moment. Uh but then again, I I'm not a street photographer or an architectural photographer or any of those things. So it's like the, those things don't interest me anyway. No, I mean um, I think, you know, I realize that in photographs of me as an adult when I've been anywhere remotely interesting, if there's any photographs of me, I've always got a camera in my hand. Yeah. Or worse, actually, my face is obscured because of my camera. Yeah. So I think, oh, maybe I've really missed a trick there with my life uh, that I've somehow reneged on the responsibility to just be in do you think that that is a, a self-defense mechanism though you think you think you're doing that on purpose so you're not part of the flow sometimes i mean That's it's interesting part. it's like you, you you know it's you know there there's an argument to me there that you don't want to be seen while simultaneously while simultaneously saying that you're not seen <laughs> you know i mean that i i i don't i mean look there aren't that many pictures of me i'm always the one taking the pictures you know in, in any in most situations um Wait, i'm assuming that in the photograph of your dad that was you taking that photograph it was yeah and then in the photograph of you that was heather taking the photograph uh yeah i guess it was yeah, yeah. um it's it had i you know and the interesting thing about it is that while it's fairly lined up i mean it's not perfect but it's pretty close um I did not reference the photo of my father. I just knew the tree was in that grove. And when we walked by it, I said, oh, there's a picture of my dad here. Let's get a picture of me standing here. But interestingly enough, you know, I had, I had, a, high, I had a friend in high school who used to be in a lot of bands and he was a very good songwriter, great player, whatever it is. But almost every time he played out, he would get a little too drunk, drink a little too much beer so that 
during the show, the shows would never be really tight or never really good. And I think he always did it so that it gave himself an excuse that if he didn't like the show, he would say, oh, well, I was just drunk. So that's why the show wasn't good. You know what I mean? But it also meant that he never actually had to test himself because there was always the excuse that he could he could roll to. In this, it's really interesting to me that I did not put down my bag and put my hands on my hips like my father did, even though I knew that was the the, the pose he was in, in my, in my mind's eye. So it's like I went all the way there and half-assed it. <laughs> Interesting. What year was this? Hmm. I was trying to work out if I was pregnant in this photograph, so that would have been maybe 10 or 11 years ago. I look quite chunky, I think. Is, um, is the sepia tone uh, by choice in post or just a yellowed uh, print? No, it's just, a, it's just a yellowed print. And also, I think this was shot on 35 mil film. F film? What's film? <laughs> yeah. So this is me with my dad, but this is me with my dad. Yeah. Uh, so as I said, I'm Sandy, he's Alexander. Um, I have really good relationships with both my mum and my dad. Do you think your father sees you differently because you are named Sandy and he's Alexander? Do you no. think he claims you in any way? No, I don't. And okay. I think that's probably part of part of why I feel so lucky to have both my parents as they are. Because yeah. much as they've at times tried to corral me, um, I don't feel like they've ever tried to... There's a natural parental thing. I mean, I do it with my child, you know, a sense that are you like me you know i wonder dad sometimes revels a bit when he thinks i'm being like him and he likes to call it and my mum also likes to call it out as well uh the two of them like to spot the other parent in me my parents are separated and have been since i was really really tiny um but the reason why i chose this is because i suppose again it's not that this is a deceptive photograph but up to a point it could be, because I could tell so many tall tales about my life, I think, based on this. I could definitely manipulate my history to suit the photograph, should I wish to. And I think in, we're all guilty. Wait, in, in, in what way? Well, I don't know. I mean, I think... To self-aggrandize, to, to uh, tell stories of your history, where you were and where you're going, you know what I mean, all that kind of stuff? or Yeah, I mean, it's as simple as, a, a, again, it's about this relationship we maybe have with truth. Um, you know, we all probably do have photographs with our loved ones that are very similar to this, where we've been uh, somewhere very familiar, doing something that is amusing or part of like a, a tradition or something that is just about being together as a family I suppose um somewhere that reminds us of a place as much as of a person and somewhere that or something in a photograph that reveals maybe what we think we want to see in our relationship I think that that is one thing that the sort of less photos theory that I just talked about really enables is sort of a, it lets you sort of define your past by choosing the photos that prescribe to a particular story. Yeah, and you know, uh, again, I, it was so, so difficult choosing the photographs for this presentation from my own family album. One, I have to say it's because not every, I did ask my family, is it okay for me to use certain photographs? It was actually really difficult to get all of my family to agree <laughs> on what photographs to use because there's a, also an issue I suppose with privacy um, and that takes me back to the Goldblatt image a little bit. I have very very rarely photographed my child and I have even uh, in that I photograph my child a lot for the photographs to be 
I guess, consumed by me and my child's father and our families. But I have never, ever been interested in uploading. Making art with your child, yeah. Uploading those photographs to Instagram or Facebook or, um, you know, I I really, it makes me, that makes me feel very uncomfortable. Um, And I'm one of those annoying parents in, in the school kind of release forms who says, please don't share images of my <laughs> of my child online. I, I, I would like my child to have the opportunity as an adult to make decisions about what they want to share about who they are. And even that notion in itself, I think, ties in with this, is that I, I want to share this part of my relationship with my dad. And I felt happy to. And I think when I sent the photograph to him and said, is it okay if I use this in my video with Bill? I suspect we both see the same quality of love and of um, father, daughter, kindness and warmth that we want people to see. Do you think that there there's there's some chance that in that conversation he would take your question as to imply that there's something wrong with the photograph that he has to give permission. Like, I know it doesn't look that great for what some imaginary reason, you know what I mean? Like, well, there are th- elements th- of vanity, I think, you know, I mean, there were things oh, that, sure, I sure. that, um, oh, now, did you ask the two guys in the background, whether they wanted to be shared? Cause no, no, I didn't actually, there was, there's another one from that. This was the, like the next door image to this on the roll. And actually there's a lady who's off camera. Uh, a local lady who's really scowling at the camera. Um, See, I would have chosen that one. That would be interesting. <laughs> no, because I was, I was thinking it's just so clear and very recognisable, and I thought, no, it would be unfair maybe to put it, <laughs> to put it in. Ah. Uh, Butte is a really small island. Now, do, do you... Did you show this only to your father because he was the only one in it? Or do you imagine your family as one organism and therefore you need to get permission for all of them for to share this kind of stuff? No, for this photograph, I felt very much that it is about the relationship I have with my dad. Yeah. Yeah. And so it was only dad I asked, could I share this and show this? But it also it, brought up things for me about how then potentially I... Um, look at photographs of my child with me and my child with her dad. Yeah. Um, I, I, I'm fascinated by the body language in this photograph in the sense that, well, first of all, your father loves two things. He loves you and he loves tractors apparently. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, But you know, even the way you're turned into him, is is really telling you know you have one arm around him and then you're also like kind of covering yourself in an interesting way but that that's also that is to do with the self-consciousness on my part right no that's what i'm saying yeah yeah um one i mean i actually really like having my photograph taken um which i think always surprises people so many people don't they they say oh i don't like having my photograph taken i actually yeah, i can't wait till we're in the same place and i have a camera this is gonna be if fun I, if i see a camera i'm gonna be leaping out in front of it you know <laughs> as much as i possibly can um but actually uh i i have always been very self-conscious i suppose in some ways mm. kind of like um it's a legacy of childhood maybe i don't mean self-consciousness i don't mean with dad at all but i mean more just um uh how to say this uh i'm just self-conscious about being a particular way coming from a particular place no i understand that i i am really like uh, we don't obviously don't have to go into more detail about it but even you talking about not wanting to say share you wouldn't take images of your daughter and share them with anybody mm-hmm. it's interesting because i put very few pictures i i mean i'll occasionally put up a picture of my wife if it's like a portrait i took of her but i don't we don't put a lot of if we're on vacation we don't keep posting a lot of pictures on instagram of us on vacation you know it's mm-hmm. just like that's about us being on vacation or us being with each other or on a trip or whatever 
that's not something I need to use as a as a self promotion tool and 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 like the way that some people do it. I just don't see it that way. But it's interesting because with somebody who is you know the age your daughter is, in a lot of ways, it could be that that generational shift of even thinking that there's such a thing as privacy and images is 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 such a bygone thought. You know what I mean? You were saying, you know, that she should be able to choose how she wants to be presented and seen in the world. It's, you know, there are a thousand cameras seeing you guys on your way to drop her off at school nowadays. You know, it's just, it's a, just a different world. And I wonder if that is a quaint desire, you know? I don't know. I mean, I speak quite a lot to, especially um, my childhood friends, friends I grew up with. And we always say how glad we are. We grew up before before the age, like the internet age, we're so grateful that we have had control of our privacy. Yeah. Um, but it's all people your age saying that. I wonder if you asked, you know, people your daughter's age in 20, 30 years, if they would say the same thing. Yeah. I just, I, I just wonder if society, if that's a big societal change that we are generally, we're, we're Luddites, I guess, to some extent, you know, about. I also just want to say about taking things from family albums here. Yep. I know a lot of people, you know, I, in many ways, it's interesting thinking about putting this onto, uh, onto the YouTube channel and thinking about how many people choose to watch it. Uh, this one in particular, uh, you know, this could be the, the one that really, really bombs, like maybe three people will watch and it'll probably be your mum and my dad and my mum. And- Oh, I'm not telling my mom about this. <laughs> um, because actually, I know there's a lot of people who really, really don't like looking at what they think of as family photographs. They find it other really people's different. photographs. Uh -huh. Yeah. And um, whereas I have to say, personally, I've always absolutely loved looking at family photographs, whether it's my family or not, doesn't matter. Um, and it struck me very much uh, in a dialogue I had with um, Alistair Heron from Ulster University a few months ago now, and also Philip who I've known since childhood, Dr. Philip Tunner, as he is now. We were talking about um, like going to flea markets. And I was saying that I've always collected photographs I find at flea markets because sometimes I feel so incredibly heart sore that anyone would ever somehow lose their family yeah, album. Lose or, or give up their family photos, yeah. Like, are these not precious? Is there nobody who finds these things missed? Yeah. Uh -huh. so, do, you, do you do you do you have good? Do you if you go to visit your parents, will you scan or photograph photographs so that you have copies of them? Do you, I mean, do you, are you worried about the 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 conservation of the family photos? Yeah, I mean, I, I think also through kind of a process, I guess, of bequeathment when older family members pass away. There's a sense that with original photographs, where does the photograph go? Uh, actually, we're a family who do argue over, <laughs> over photographs. Yeah. Um, I think it's- how about, how about dates on the back? How do you feel about dating? For, you know, some people would say the smart thing to do is to, on the back, write Sandy and Alexander at the local tractor show, <laughs> you know, circa, you know, 2000, June, 2009 or whatever it was, right? Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of pictures where it's like, I don't know where this was. I don't know who these people are. And then you have to ask some older relative and they say, oh, that older woman in the middle, that's, you know, your aunt Peg who died at 30 years old or whatever it is. Like you never met her. And that might be the only picture of aunt Peg that exists in your psyche or, you know what I mean? In your family's realm. But isn't it funny that these people do exist as in they do exist in our psyche. And again, I think this is particular to families. Um, I have a very, very loud, very dynamic family and my parents, for example, are lovely and they both also have extremely big personalities. I don't think either of them will mind me saying that. Um, and they are both in their own way, very good storytellers. And I guess I come on both sides from long lines of, of storytellers. I don't mean people telling tall tales. I mean, just keeping that spark of like a family narrative alive. Of course, I question why we feel the need to do that, but I definitely feel like I've inherited that. Um, I guess it's an interest. It's 
it's about putting oneself into time but also taking oneself beyond one's own time and feeling through the the archetype the family yeah. mm. uh, i take it I, I i take it back this photograph was taken a day after that last one. Oh, okay uh this is on the same trip and i think there's three photographs from this trip just because they are i don't know they were archetype my there weren't a ton of pictures of my father and i other than this except for older ones which we'll get to uh yeah this is in death valley at the lowest point in the western hemisphere which is kind of creepy that if there was water was let in here we'd be 300 feet below mm. <laughs> the level of the ocean but yeah, I mean, there is, you know, it could be that my father and his father took a trip similar to that, or it could be that, you know, you know, our grandfather once drove across the country to Alaska. This is a true story. And he just left one day and no one knew where he went until he sent a letter home. You know, this is like the kind of crazy stuff. Maybe on the way there, he went through Death Valley and then drove up north. Mm. And my grandfather once stood here. I don't, you know, I don't know. But like, let's say that th that is a thing. By the way, I'll tell you one quick little aside. Years later, my wife Heather and I were here at Badwater and we walked out on that plane out there at dawn. And we were out, you know, 200 yards out onto the salt flats at dawn the sun's coming up there's just like we're in the dark on a giant salt flat that goes for miles in every direction and these german guys with black socks and 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 sandals on come out and are standing right freaking next to us when there's like six <laughs> miles of nothingness in every direction <laughs> and they were somehow pissed that we were there and it's like dude we were here first, you crazy German people. Anyway. Anybody listening from Germany, please don't take any offense at all at what Will is saying. Unless you were those two guys and, you know, you could have walked over there and whatever. Uh, no, it's not about them being German, but they were German guys. But they were, they were really mad somehow that we were there before them. I'm like, well, you should have gotten up earlier. Um, I find this interesting because, I mean, yes, it's the obvious thing to have one of us on either side of, of sign like this. But you know what? Two people who, who liked each other more maybe would have been both behind the sign leaning on it next to each other. Or, you know what I mean? Like, there's different ways you could have composed this photograph. Okay, so, you know, obviously yeah. I put these in an order, right? Yeah. And this isn't like, oh, don't my dad and I have such a wonderful relationship? We do. But actually, there is so much in a photograph, isn't there? And when we look at these family photographs, they are just as loaded as yep. any fancy fine art photograph we would see in any gallery. And yet they're yep. residing in the bottom of boxes in attics and in dusty old albums tucked away. And there are literally there. billions of them. And there are so many of them. And I think, you know, let's tell let's tell our children and our, our friends and you know, go look at your photographs. Go and look at the stories. Find those things. I mean, when you look at this bill, I mean, is this very painful to look at? No, uh, only because, you know, actually I had, a, I had a long conversation this morning. I went for a long walk at 6.30 a.m. with a woman that I used to date 20 years ago who lives in the neighborhood. And she lost her father from cancer when I met her and then you know 10 years later i lost my father to cancer uh and so we were walking and we were talking about losing parents and all the rest of it and talking about just sort of getting over how many layers there are of getting over the death of your parents like you could be mad that they died you could be mad about things they did before they died you could be mad that they're not there now to see your kids or whatever you know what i mean the different layers of the onion there are i've come to peace with the fact that my father's no longer around I've spent many, many years of therapy coming to terms with the way that I felt because of the way my father was towards me often. So it is, it is interesting to look at these as they're sort of signposts along a road. You know what I mean? They're, they're, they're snapshots in the meta term of it, of, of our relationship. And 
the interesting thing about it, especially along this trip, which, you know, like I said, was two weeks long, 14 days. And we drove like 4,000 miles in 14 days. Um, was that our relationship changed a lot over those 14 days, you know, and this is halfway through that trip or, or somewhere about. And so I feel like in some ways the, the, the thaw was melting a little bit more around now in that trip. So in some ways I look at this and yes, while the, while the physicality of it is obviously separated and distant, we're both leaning in towards each other. <laughs> you know what I mean, like there's at least that. Um, Did you, um, when you told people about this trip you were going on? Yeah. Did people think it was an odd thing to do? For you two with your particular relationship? I think that I, I don't know. I don't, I don't remember people having much reaction to it. I, saw it as the fact that my father even read the book, let alone suggested we take some sort of trip together. Mm. I am a firm believer if somebody is, is, is putting out their hand that you should take their hand yeah. because it is a difficult thing to ask. You know what I mean? Uh, which is, you know, so, just there was a, there... that, that, um, in in terms of if you could at all think about what he felt going on this trip with you yeah did he want to did he see it as the same opportunity as i did mm -hmm. yes i think so i mean a part of it like i said is the fact part of it i think was the fact that he was a very different person when he wasn't drinking mm -hmm. so there was like it, this was two weeks of him not drinking and he had the shakes like he hadn't like this was the first time he hadn't drank in 40 years you know mm. so so there you know there was a, there was a lot to it i thought i think he saw it as an opportunity he also at the time didn't know he was going to die in a year i sometimes wonder how that would have changed things you know if he, let's say he was terminally ill at the time which he was he didn't know it at the time would he have would that have changed the whole situation do you think he did sort of know it that there, there is in all these photographs. I'm sorry to be so um, no, stark, no. but you know, there that photographs are an awareness in some way, very deeply of, of death, because the photograph dies, dies with the moment, yep. much as it prolongs the life of what we remember. Yep. It's dead. I think that I, I think that that the single photo of him coming up later, I think is is the one that I stare at sometimes and go, oh. Is there something else going on here? You know, um, I think that's coming here. Oh yeah, there you go. Yeah. And that's a, that's in Yellowstone. And th it's interesting because this one's got all kinds of stuff going on. It was in Yellowstone a couple of years after they had a major fire. Mm. So there were entire hills and swaths of, uh, of the park that were like that knocked down burnt trees, very barren. Which, of course, you know, only adds to things. Uh, yeah, this was on just some overlook, and, and, and I just took a picture of him. Do I look like him, by the way, in profile? You, there, there are obvious similarities. Um, what, again, <laughs> going back to our very first uh, photograph, which is the official photograph that's not from our family album, the gold black yep. You know, that's an award-winning photograph now in the Taylor Weston Prize, international accolade, blah, blah, blah. This photograph, I think, when you sent the images to me for the presentation, this this one, it stood out obviously because it's all the photographs you sent to me were of your dad. Um, but this is the only one in which you don't all, also feature. And I thought about this as being maybe one of those photographs that is so much more than could ever be belittled as a family snapshot that I don't know, but I can assume from what I see. And, and even if I didn't know you and a little bit, at least about the relationship, I, I would be able to really go into this image, uh, to spend time with this image and really see something that is actually maybe troubling. 
do you, you don't think that that is that you're retconning that because of what you do know about our relationship um maybe i can't obviously answer that truthfully bill yeah. but i can say that actually you you and i talk all the time about this we take away the context what have we got are we able to do it it's very yeah. very difficult to do but i would say this is a very pensive photograph and it, it yeah. might just be that he happened to turn his head that way i don't know but no I, the thing the, the thing that i like about this photograph two well two things one this all, all of these photographs from this trip were in 2004 this is years before i considered myself a photographer in any way I was not a professional photographer. This was, this was, I had just bought a digital rebel, you know, camera. And this was the first trip I was taking with a camera. And I was like, wanted to take pictures of, of the parks. I was in no way a portrait photographer. I was in no way trying to, you know, capture anything specific. The thing that I find fascinating about this is every picture of my father, where he's looking at the camera, at least the two that I've shown. And if you go through the series, they're all like that. My father's always, He's got a big smile. He's, you know what I mean? He's like putting on a face. He's like there. He's, you know, he's putting on a show a little bit. And there are two photographs of my father, this being one. And then in April of the next year, this is in June of 04, in April of 05, when he knew he was sick and he was dying, I set up a blue sheet in our living room and I took some pictures of my father uh, with a strobe and they're awful. And I, it's like now, having the skills and experience that I have now of what would I do if I had my father in front of me now taking pictures? Mm. It just, it kills me to take, take, even look at these. But in every single frame, Sandy, he's got the smile and doing the whole thing, except for the first frame that I, when I set up the strobe and I just hit the button just to see if the strobe was working and it's out of focus and it's the shot of my father with his face on and you think to yourself, oh, that's really what was going on in his head. Mm. And I think that this picture is really what's going on in his head. You know, it's sort of this is unguarded. Well, you said to me before that very often clients will not like the photograph you pick of them. Yeah. Because it's the one that probably shows something of the real them. Yep. And again, thinking about this in context of family photographs and family albums, you quite rightly said at the start when we're looking at Goldblatt's image, you know, maybe there is an element of kind of contrivance that the photograph is contrived it's not um just a family snapshot it's not just a family photograph maybe she's orchestrated every single element carefully curated it um this one is not orchestrated but actually we again <laughs> there's this extraordinary wealth of story of um kind of compassion and humility of, of a wider humanity in our family albums. Sure. And the face we choose to show in our family photographs is as revealing maybe as if we were, if we knew we were being photographed by a so-called proper photographer. I do, I wonder how, um, if we can go there and it's okay to go there, I wonder how your dad would feel now being photographed by you, knowing that you are now considered a fancy professional photographer. It's, it, it, it is a weird thing that I've thought about a lot, you know, um, cause he died before I even, you know, started getting serious about this stuff. So yeah, here we are 16 years on you know, and I've had a career doing this professionally and, and, you know, it is a, it is, it is a strange feeling because my father was, you know, it's, it's funny. My father was an amateur photographer and there's actually eight millimeter footage of family movies that I had uh, digitized. And when I watched them, there's tw six seconds of my father with a camera in his hands, uh, putting a flash on a camera and loading film fast. And Heather saw it and she goes, oh my God, that looks like you loading film into a camera. Like it, like the physicality of the way he handled a camera was very similar to me. And when I was growing up, I had, my father had a Canon AE-1, like a, a SLR. And I wasn't allowed to touch it because it was like the fancy expensive camera. And one day I didn't listen to that and I took it to school and I took pictures in the seventh grade and I got in so much trouble. 
And after my father died, I inherited that camera and it's downstairs in my closet. And it is the, this isn't like a, a value judgment, just like, but it's the crappiest camera I own. Right. You know what I mean? Is this camera that was the thing I couldn't touch when I was in seventh grade. And sometimes I think about that. I'm like, that is just so strange how life goes that way. You know what I mean? And, and what are you going to say? Well, I just think that's the legacy of photographs right there. What you've just said, yeah. so you're talking about it as a kind of anecdote about an actual camera. The fact is the photograph is the same thing. Yep. So, you know, these times that we hold so precious, what really are they to us? You know, again, this idea, you go to a flea market, you can buy some other person's whole family album, you know, those moments captured that were so important, they were photographed. What are they now? They're, you know, do you, do you think though that, you know, in, in the, in the, in the flea market family album, uh, uh, scenario, do you think that, for example, some people would just flip through and be like, it's all pictures of some people. I don't know. I don't really care, but yeah. people who are more, I'm going to use the term poetically inclined like yourself dive into them because you 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 want to absorb the meaning that that is inherent in them yeah but i think i also am, I'm, I'm aware that i must be as respectful as i possibly can one because that is somebody's family um but two also i have to be respectful in that i don't just project my own fantasy onto it for my own pleasure I suppose. Why not? Well, um, again, uh, using words like respect are very loaded, aren't they? It just seems like, you know, these are photographs I get. This is from my family. This is me, the small girl. This is my Your dad. dad's got great <laughs> hair. <laughs> yes. <laughs> he, he still has great hair, except it's white, completely white now. Um, yeah, if, if you recreated that picture on in the in the bottom half where if you just like laid down his chest, it would just be white on white on white with white hair. <laughs> um, you know, somebody found these photographs in a flea market. Yeah. God, it kind of steals me in my heart space. It's a horrible feeling. It's like, well, why should somebody not love these photographs? In, because they're they're almost like tokens then, and, and it's horrible to think of them as just tokens of, of a life. But that is what they are. But I, I think then that's why it's so important to respect that they are about life. These people aren't nobody. But there's all kinds of issues with this. As I said to you, when I was choosing the photographs, loads and loads of stuff came up. Um, and I have, by and large, I mean, as much as there have have been very sad and unhappy times in my family history. Um, I have really lovely parents and I have a lovely wider family, beautiful, brilliant aunties and lovely uncles and a various assortment of half and step siblings. Uh, you know, lovely people. And um, I, I, I feel very troubled thinking that there's something about the dust of them. <laughs> and I really look at that. You know, I, I want I want to kind of be wise to that and not just a little bimbling poetic idea that, that these are so meaningful because they're meaningful to me. But I think just generally photographs. Yeah. I didn't mean to make that a derogatory, uh, uh, derogatory statement, by the way, the poetically inclined. Oh, I don't take offense. Okay. Can I ask you a, a, a family personal question that you can choose not to answer if you want? Yeah. Uh, you, you said your parents split up when you were younger. Yeah. Are they, they, and they had other families or they had, you know what I mean? They had, they both met people and had a whole other thing. Does that change the way that you see even the two of them together in that picture in the corner? Well, interestingly, um, when I was going through the, the paper photographs to, to re-photograph them for this, um, I did have a bit of a, a weepy moment with this photograph of my mum and dad. Because of sort of what I'm trying to say? Yeah, I mean, again, it's... Like, it's, here was a moment in young people's lives and, and you know, how, how old were they? They were 30 years old, you know what I mean? They're, they're yeah. babies. Yeah. 
And of course, then I think about it with my child and I think about all the photographs that I have with my child and her dad. Yeah. And what and, is she going to think of those years later? You know, yeah. when she looks back and she sees her mum at 30 and her dad at 30 and, you know, we're all so civilised. I suppose if it's okay to say all decent humans, but we're all loaded up with our own saddle banks, bags of sadness. Sure. Title, title for the show, Saddlebags of Sadness. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, so yeah, these photographs give me pause because they make me consider all those very um, tricky emotions like regret and a desire or a wish that maybe could things have been different and of course no they can't and I shouldn't want that and I don't want that because as it is and as I've said I'm so so lucky do you father. remember the photo of you in the backpack and the Care Bear getting taken yes I do actually because I also that it wasn't a backpack bill it was a satchel um, oh, I'm sorry. I, it could go either way, to it, be fair, right? It, it could be a backpack. Didn't. And I so, so keenly remember that, that, that satchel. <laughs> my goodness, I thought I was the absolute bee's knees with that red satchel. I remember... Oh, is it, it just shi is it just shiny? It's not a pattern on it. It's just shiny plastic? Shiny plastic, it was like... Oh, I see, yeah. I remember skipping along Stucky Hall Street in Glasgow, having bought that satchel for starting school. <laughs> and it, it's a really, really early memory, obviously. I was only been four. Um, and I remember getting dressed up in my school uniform and the Care Bear mum coming to collect me. Uh, it was actually after my first day at school and strapped into the back seat of her car was Bedtime Bear Care Bear. And I honestly thought like the equivalent would be winning the lottery now. Honestly, I like, had my red satchel. I'd gone to school. I'd met my teacher. I'd met somebody actually who is still one of my, my loveliest friends, Jamie. We were together on the squirrel table in primary one. Um, and there I was, came out, and there was Bedtime Bear Care Bear. Anyway, these kinds of anecdotes, like you and I find them amusing as friends, but I know that other people listening will think this is dull as ditch water. Yeah, but, okay, but, first of all, aren't you impressed that I knew that it was a Care Bear? No. <laughs> Everybody uh, knows Care Bears, though. I mean, don't <laughs> really. Uh, so, 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 yeah, so this was just a, a, a first day of school gift from your mother, is that what you're saying? Yeah, but the red satchel and the Care Bear together was like a double whammy. It was like, yeah, you, you, honestly, how could you ask for more in life? Well, you can't when you're fine. You can't, you can't. Yeah, you're done. Um. Anyway, back to the sad, very thoughtful stuff. <laughs> you know, it is, it is a, a, a kind of melancholy that comes from this, a wistfulness and a poignancy. And again, who needs a fancy, like fine art photograph? to get that resonance just yeah. go and look at your own family photographs there's not a family i know that doesn't have these pockets of um yeah poignancy well i think part of that has to do well first of all who took the other two pictures so the picture of my mum and me and my dad would have been either my grandmother or my grandfather okay and then the one of your dad do you, do you know who could have it taken that my mum i would think so i mean I, I will tell you that the look in your father's eyes in the lower one is, I think part of what we're talking about here is this, I'm going to use the word familiarity, but that's sort of ontologically, you know, too correct. You know what I mean? That, that there is a trust with the photographer and the, and the subject in a lot of family photos you know, the, the trust that I need to spend a long time or, you know, telling stories or asking questions or whatever it is that I have to do professionally to get the person to trust me in order to get what I need to get in the moment from them. To a large extent, that that's often in family photos inherent, right? That's there because it's, you know, 
my wife taking a picture of me, I am not going to have a guard up when my wife is taking a picture of me holding our child. You know what I'm saying? Like this is th that bottom one is as ungarden a moment as you could possibly have, you know? And, and I feel like you can see it in his eyes. Like there's nothing, there's nothing in the way there. Mm -hmm. And, well, and you know, there's so many things that rush in for me. I mean, obviously this is my dad. I can't remember being that tiny newborn baby nestled into him. I can't remember it. But what's interesting is looking at the photograph and I, I, would, I would like to say this actually and ask you whether you do the same. Um, I don't know if it's like some kind of out of body experience or something, but when photographs like this one of my dad with me as a baby, um, obviously I can't remember being the baby, but I remember the photograph. Um, yeah, 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 I see what you're saying. You know, Do you identify with that baby? Do you look at that baby and go, oh yeah, that's me, even though you obviously have no memory of that moment? I think what I identify with more is I actually identify with the presence in my dad of me. And this comes back to kind of what we were touching on before about this sense that we've come from somewhere. <laughs> uh, yeah. You know, I, I've come from I've come from that person, and there's no more an immediate link really than seeing yourself with your parents. You know, when you saw the photograph of my mum and dad earlier, you said, "My God, you look so like your mum." And. Um, but even that kind of thing, you know, this idea of like, who do I look like? And you've already asked, you know, did you look like your dad? And I, I wonder, you know, we're always looking and reaching in photographs to identify. And even in photographs of people we don't know, we're reaching to identify, to feel okay about maybe who we are or where we come from, that there's something of the familiar, there's something of the meaningful and the connectedness of life for all of us in all photographic spaces of family or of people. Do you think so? I mean, I look at your portrait work and I think, you know, I don't know many of these people, but often I find myself making, I guess they're judgments. Inferences. About who I am in relation to them. Yeah. I think that humans, my friend Bianca, who just got out of the hospital yesterday, mm. loves this Instagram feed of this woman who has a dog who has these buttons on the ground mm -hmm. and the dog hits buttons and it says something like, you know, outside squirrel, daddy snack. And, and he said, and, 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 you know, cause it talks whenever the dog hits the buttons and the woman goes, oh, you want daddy to take you outside after you have a snack? And it's like, the dog didn't say that the dog was just hitting buttons. The person wanted to see a pattern mm. because that's the way our brains work. Cause that's the, you know, evolutionarily been built. Yeah. So I think that, I think in some ways it's that pattern matching stuff that I think that humans are primed to make those connections because that leads to survival. Yeah. And, and, and I'm not saying that, that, that dismisses it in any way, but I think that, I think that there's a, there's an evolutionary advantage to, 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 to trying to make connections with other people from a survival point of view. And I think that in the modern world, we do that by say, even looking at photographs of other people, you know what I mean? And, and seeing how it all fits together. And maybe these people are of a clan. Oh, this is the classic picture. This is at my, gr my father's childhood home, my grandparents' home. And do you, I, I'm sorry, Bill, but I do yeah. just ask off the back of what you were saying. Do you identify with yourself? Yes. Okay. This, this kid in this picture is how I feel when a client yells at me. It's rare. The clients love me, but every once in a while. <laughs> I was going to say, hang on a second there. I don't edit <laughs> afterwards, as you know. Don't be saying things like that on the, on the channel. Bill is up consummate professional everybody uh no i i think that um the the thing that okay what, what is the thing that, that that you instantly notice about this picture well okay so this will be different maybe to the actual 
sense you have, but I that's fine. The the hand, your hand, yeah, away from his body. Yep. And I didn't I, notice that, by the way, until adulthood that 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 I was doing that. But I think that's that's a tell, isn't it? Really, don't you sure. see me kind of cooing in to my dad? In that yep. very first photograph, there's a sense, you know, that again, it's like an opposite angle, isn't it? I'm seeking protection. You are actively uh, detaching. Mm, yeah. you're, you're breaking the, the airlock there. Truthfully, yeah. I look at this photograph and I, I see, I do see misery, Bill, is the truth. Of what I Mostly see. because of my terrible jeans I'm wearing. Well, I was going to say the sartorial disaster doesn't help. <laughs> but then you think, even now, sometimes I comment on the sartorial disasters. I know. Um, you think I'm a sartorial disaster right now? <laughs> well, I, I, I wouldn't like to say uh, <laughs> in this exact moment. Um, I, you know, what's interesting about that I find about this is that I don't think that I had my left hand out so that it would be seen. You know what I mean? I, I, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have done that in a way that somebody would notice. God, how old am I in this picture? Uh, 10, 10. 12, somewhere around there. I, I would not have taking this picture so that 35 years later, I would notice that I wasn't touching my father. Um, so that's like just by chance, or my hand was out more than I thought, or the camera, you know what I mean? Whatever the thing was, it's like that wasn't purposefully in the shot, but it is very telling. And I, it's, it's, it's kind of why I put it in the, in the mix. I just thought it was interesting. Um, and I mean, it, it gives you a little bit of a insight into the thing that in many ways was trying to be overcome in the later shots that are the earlier shots in our case. Mm. Um, there was a lot of, there was a lot of ground to make up. Um, Why do you think I put time backwards in our family album today? um is there an actual answer to this well i mean obviously it doesn't it doesn't give you an easy tell does it no no because it, you know if we'd started at, at the beginning where we're going to end you would have been able to kind of i guess build up something yeah. but actually yeah. i i really kind of want us just to go straight to the heart of things of course it's, it's, it strips it away you're you're taking things away as opposed to building on things in some ways Mm. And going I, from I, the end of the story to the beginning yeah I, I sort of wonder with the beginning of your story here this is at you at an age where you are going into very early um adulthood i suppose uh yeah. and you're definitely going to already have a sense of self in a way that's perhaps different even two or three years before when you're kind of five six seven you're developing that but you're also still so utterly beholden and reliant on parent on the parent figure and then at this it is like a disengagement from a parent at this age anyway even if you have a very good healthy relationship with a parent there's still a sense that there's a, 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 an increasing move, distance. movement away that the distance starts Building. Although it's it's funny when I see that hand, I don't see it as me detaching. I see it as me pulling my hand away from a hot mm. stove. You know what I mean? Yeah. That that's you know that's it's an aggressive removal, not a oh I'm going to inch away and be close enough that I can run back to the to the herd. If you know what I mean, like the standard psychological detachment, slow detachment sort of theory. Um, you know what's funny? I always think about in this in this photograph that even the the dark wood and the stain on the doors and the and the molding around there, it's like I can imagine what my grandparents' house smelled like just based upon that. There's also all of that which is in a lot of these photos, especially if they're in a place that you knew well. Yeah, 
But, you know, I don't have this memory, Bill. Yeah. But I could so easily cultivate a sense of it too. Now, yeah. that's culturally because though you're from the States and I'm from the UK, there are obvious crossovers. We are of a similar age. Um, I can I can smell the house. Yeah. Uh, you know, I know I sound just like such a weirdo half the time when I talk about these things. I can smell the house. Um, the call is coming from inside Sandy. Yeah. <laughs> But I definitely get a sense that, you know, again, this is about looking at photographs that go right back to the beginning into that gold black image. Do we get a real sense of being in that garden or in that tent? Um, and actually, yes, I do. And I'm doing that all the time, as many people are, with all imagery, but finding, again, connections and something to build a relationship with within the photograph. And much as to, to me, again, even as much as I can say uh, with any integrity, if I was to take away what I know and I was just to look at this photograph, I would feel very uneasy and unhappy in this, in this place. Yes, it's, it's, it's the, the smile on my father's face and the fake smile on my face, I think, belie the reality that you can see through you know, all of that. Maybe that's just my own interpretation of it, looking at it years later. But I, you know, I think if, if you took two people who weren't us and gave them this photograph and asked them to analyze it from that kind of point of view, I think they'd see a lot of stuff in it too. Yeah. But again, what's interesting is that I don't have that many pictures of me and my father. This is like one of a handful. When your father was being photographed here, do you have any sense at all of how he felt? I think my father wanted other people to be proud of him. And I think that, you know, he wanted to stand with his son so that other people said, oh, look at what a great job. His parents called him Billy. It, you know, that Billy does, you know, is doing, look at his family and, you know what I mean? Like, I think it was a, see what I made here, mom and dad. Cause you know, I think that there was a lot of that sort of thing. I mean, he seems genuinely happy to be there with me in this photograph. Like that's a genuine smile on my father's face, a genuine, my father smile on my father's face. Um, But I think the physicality of it belies so much of that, that, that I wonder if in the moment he realized that was going on too, or if he was so wrapped up in the, in the message he was trying to send that he didn't even see it, you know, or feel it or, or, but or understand it. How do you think he would feel seeing the photograph? Now? Hmm. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know that he ever saw this when he was alive. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, I don't know that we ever looked at it or talked about it. I, you know, my father, it's like, I'm coming to terms, I've come to terms over the years with the fact that my, my father was a very sad man in many ways, you know? Um, well, uh, what do other people though in the family see in this photograph? I think that also is a kind of relevant thing to think about is that, you know, we can walk into a gallery and go yeah. look at all these different images and each one of us will bring something afresh because of our experience yep. and so on. But within a family unit, looking at family photographs, do we in fact all see the same things, even though we all might belong to the same family and in actual fact be part of the same photograph? We see so many, perhaps. Yeah, you, you, you see as many facets as there are people in the photograph, right? I'm sure, yeah. I'm sure my mum may see very different things to my dad or me to- In those pictures dad. there? Yeah. You know, I, t I went off on one about, you know, the Care Bear and the Red Satchel. I'm sure my mom has a very good memory, uh, but I'm sure there are things so loaded and potent for her in these photographs. And again, I think that's going to be part of why, much as my family are very loud and dynamic and they, they're also very cautious about their privacy because their, their past and their history hasn't always been happy. 
Do you think though that there is like even in the picture of you with the Care Bear, the Care Bear photograph, as we will forever more call it, yeah. uh, that was a very important moment in what for you so far was a not very long life. You know what I mean? Like that that was a that was a a big you know a milestone moment in your life for your mother it was the day that she was trying to be nice to you and got you a care bear and picked you up from school you know your 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 relative importance of that day is very different i bet maybe but you know the other thing i realized through selecting the photographs and speaking to family about is it okay if i use these photographs you know um i do feel all right just mentioning it for myself you know you said in the very early photograph we looked where you'd paired the image of you with your dad yeah um you know 14 months after that photograph was taken of your dad he was dead yep well i could say that within you know photo photographs are also markers or lines in the sand aren't they for events yep. um you know, I look at my mum and dad with me as the flower girl at my auntie's wedding. Well, it was maybe it was my uncle's wedding, actually. Um, you know, they were separate very shortly after this. And after the wedding or after the Care Bear picture? After the, the, the image of the three of us. And then after the oh, Care okay, Bear yeah. picture, it wasn't very long until I was, I was very ill as a child. And I spent a lot of time in hospital and it was a great worry for my family. And I look at this little girl, um, in Scotland in the early 80s, it was actually quite unusual. Uh, there was only me and one other child whose parents were divorced at primary school. You know, it wasn't kind of regular. <laughs> yeah. And um, I think, I look at this little person and I, I identify with her. I feel really sad for her as well. I feel really glad for her. Thank goodness I do have the family I have and there's such resilience and love. But I also think, my God, we went through some really crappy times. Sure. Um, but as you said, you wouldn't change any of those things. No, but would you? Sometimes I think that I would be a better version of the person that I am if things, some things were different. But that's assuming that, that there is some sort of, you know, platonic ideal of me inside of me to achieve, you know what I'm saying? That is separate from the circumstances with which I was living in. Um, I, 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 I don't know. I, you know, that's the, obviously the answer is no, I would not change a thing. And in, and in my adult life, no, I would not change a thing. My childhood, I might want to change things, but, but that's just, I mean, it's obviously you can't change the past. So it's irrelevant except well, in the movie I'm is, writing. This is something else I just want to say, and we've actually been talking for far too long this evening, Phil. Too long? Never. Yeah, we've got actually several more slides, but I, I wonder if we should... I wonder if we should... Uh, Two-parter? Yeah, maybe. All right, well, whatever you want to do. I'm just, I'm, I, I'm just wondering, because you, know, you and I make these things, and I put them up on the channel, and actually I do like the idea that somebody somewhere might watch them but I think if we go into like the two hour zone, then we might lose <laughs> this whole audience. Sure. We have. I, the only thing I will say though, is if, if we try to come back to it, we're going to lose whatever energy we have now and it'll be a completely other show. Okay. So then advice for any watchers who take this on that we will keep talking now, Bill, but that we yeah. advise you maybe have a breakaway, like an intermission. Yeah. Do, do, do. Do, do, do. Go guess. <laughs> Go to the lobby and get your popcorn. <laughs> okay. But I mean, we can we can go a little bit faster through the other ones. But yes. All right. So what? Where where are we looking here? Where this is your parents' wedding day? Uh, so it's my mum and dad's wedding, and in that photograph down at the bottom is actually my great grandparents. So it's my dad's grandparents, and I was very lucky when I was born for quite a long time. I didn't just have my grandparents, I had great grandparents as well. That's crazy. 
Mm, and they all lived to be quite ancient in their 90s. <laughs> and um, so I, I knew them for quite a long time. It wasn't just that I was like three or four. And very, very tragically, my dad's dad passed away when I was still uh, very, very young. And I have really no real recollection of him. And, and that's the gentleman you can see in the photograph with my dad's mum, obviously, my, my paternal grandparents. Right. Um, I, I wanted to put these in because, again, I, I really like the sense in family photographs where I'm not present. I feel so incredibly present. Yeah. Like, like the, almost as if you are inevitable based upon the situation that's in the photograph. It's not just the inevitability of me, but it is, it is kind of like an actuality. The inevitability of Sandy. There's another <laughs> title for the show. <laughs> but there's, there's also a sense that, you know, we've all also somehow always been. Yeah. Through every little impact and effect of all life that's led up to me at this point. Um, also, just a little aside, I know we're zooming through this now, but... Um, characters and families you know i love that there are so many stories in my all, family all, all of those smiles by the way are genuine your father looks a little tired of smiling probably because it's later in the day and he's been smiling all day because it's his wedding and he's had to smile for a billion pictures what's but really like, annoying about this photograph is that actually you know you commented on my dad's hair before and yeah. um, my dad's hair at their wedding was absolutely humongous. It was like a giant orb around his head. Oh, that's cool. You can't see it in this photograph because of the black background. It's black on black, yeah. Yeah, so um, his dad, by the way, is, I don't know if you've heard of Mackindoo's guinea pigs. In the Second World War, obviously lots of, especially young men, suffered from terrible burns and disfigurements. Yeah. And Mackindoo was a pioneering plastic surgeon. And my papa, Robertson, uh, was in a plane that was shot down and he was very badly burned. And he was one of Mackindoo's guinea pigs to trial this pioneering plastic surgery technique and skin grafting. Yeah, I was going to say skin grafts, sure. Yeah. And then so he had a special little button. And again, I'm speaking like I can remember this notice. You know, this is an extension of the photographs, isn't it? I'm speaking as if I can remember that Papa had this experience. Sure. Uh, but I only know it because I've been told it. Isn't that a weird thing? Like he, he had a little pin that was guinea pig club pin. Oh, that's cool. Where, where's the pin? You know, an uncle probably has it somewhere. You should you should track that down. Um, but I don't know. Again, you and I are of an age where our parents, baby boomers, their parents were in the war. Sure. The great grandparents in the First World War. You know, there's such a an arc of history, and again, I don't know it but it's almost like i can feel it somehow or maybe yeah. that's just me because my family are always jabbering on we're always talking <laughs> we're always telling each other everything and so i think also when when like my papa robertson died when he was in his 50s because he died so tragically young i think maybe there is a sense that we animate him through talking about him and you mentioned you know like the past is gone i do wonder if the past is gone like is the past actually dead is history dead or is it really alive because we're alive and we're communicating through <laughs> i don't know are we conduits for the past i don't know well it's a it's a very it's a very coco analysis of it um you know the, the, but the movie you know the whole idea that somebody's not dead and if if there are people who knew them still alive you know i mean i mean it's like i love the various ways you seek to diminish what i say 
Uh, not diminishing anything. It, it was a very, you know, well-known, uh, regarded movie with theories and stuff. But I, I, I totally, I haven't seen it. This is what I've been told. I can't watch movies like that because they'll make me ball. Um, I still have yet to watch Up for the second time because it just killed me the first five minutes oh of it. God. Yes. I like I, I sat there and I just thought, you know, my biggest fear is regret and that entire movie is all about regret. And it's just like, oh, my God. Anyway. I didn't mean I didn't mean to to, to dismiss what you're saying. I, I no, you're right. I think that we. We are live. It, it, what, I, what I would say, though, is that you could imagine some scenario where the grandchild of the uncle who has the guinea pig pin will find that pin, will have never heard the story about his great grandfather or whatever it is, and be like, what's this guinea pig pin? And then when he dies, it ends up at a flea market and somebody like you finds it and they go, what is this guinea pig pin? Not knowing this enormity of history that goes along with it, you know what I mean? So things do get lost in time. I mean, it does It does happen, you know? And, uh, but there, there's, so there's something tragically sad about that but at the same time, there's also something, some a little bit of like a ashes to ashes, dust to dust. We have these experiences, we have these memories, we pass them along to our children or grandchildren or friends or whatever it is. But in the end, it all just settles back down into that void that you were talking about in the beginning that you came from. Yeah. You know, and, and I'm not a religious person, so like I, you know, I don't I don't subscribe to any, you know, reincarnation or theory of cyclical nature of of time or any of that kind of stuff but but there is something there's some sort of inherent beauty to the idea that like came from nothingness and we end up as nothingness and and that's okay that's sort of that's what's supposed to happen you know i this picture you just put up which my mother i put it i i used to put this up for the first few years, the first few years after my father died, I would write some sad post on social media about the death of my father. And, you know, as one does. And this was always the photo that I would use because it is the most. First of all, I look at this picture and I think to myself, my father was 32 years old there or, you know, whatever the hell he was when this picture was taken. Um, but there's this innocence in this picture, right? There's, you know, it's just a, a, pair, a father and his kid standing by the shore of the ocean. It's like like limitless possibility and all of those, you know, all of those sort of themes that you could you could layer on top of it. The reality of it was very different than that. And I also see him and I see the way he's standing and I see the way his legs are shaped or whatever it is. And I have similar calves to my father or whatever it is you know what i mean and i and you can see yourself in a photograph i'm sure there's pictures of your mother when she was younger than you and you think oh my god like is when i was you know the age i was when i had my daughter is that what my mother felt when she had me is that how she felt you know what i mean you, or you know what was it that direct or or does everyone have their own little experience you know i don't know well, I do think there is something in this that I, I also want to mention about, you know, I've shown mainly photographs, I suppose, of me with dad because I took your lead, really. But um, I, I was just trying to I was just trying to to simplify a larger family dynamic is, is all I was trying to do by choosing photos of my father. Yeah, but, you know, what I would say is that I have photo many photographs of me with mum. Yeah. Um, and I think now I have many photographs of me with Imogen yep. and I I do what you've just said actually I, I spend time thinking about this idea of being anchored in a present where I'm also somehow in the past and also somehow in the future yeah Moving did you away. bring a Care Bear to Imogen on her first day of first grade or whatever are you kidding I still got that Care Bear and that is upstairs in her room I, but yeah, I mean, th there, I mean, there is a certain, there is a certain question though, that like, you know, your, ex your experience of, you know, your daughter's first day of school, her experience of it may be as intense as you with your red bag and your Care Bear, you know what I'm saying? And it's, it's, it, you know, and to, to, to classify the relative importance of different experiences, especially cross-generationally, it, it, it's one of those things that you change your, the way you see it as you yourself get older. Yeah. You know, 
um, w w if I had children and I brought my children to the beach and I was holding my kid's hand in the sand, I mean, you know, we have relatives and nieces and nephews and friends who have kids that, that I see as my, you know, sort of adoptive children and I feel close to them. And if I stand on the beach and I hold one of their hands, my God, even if it was my own child with my own genetics and all the rest of the, go everything that goes along with that, just, you know, I don't know how my father felt in this moment. I would imagine that he felt something really deep and intense because that's how I would feel in that moment. But am I only feeling that because I've seen this picture and it's so indelibly connected to my own childhood and everything that I put into that? I don't know, photographs, man, it's really complicated. Photographs, aren't you so privileged to be a photographer, Bill? Look at the, look at the nice, uh 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 golden ratio my mother got with that with that horizon it is a beautiful photograph nice job mom mm. <laughs> she did good yeah she did good sitting on her chair with her baby oil stuff that she used to put on when she went into the sun oh my good god <laughs> yeah so we've come at last don't worry audience to the last these are your grandparents like my mom's mom and dad yeah they were very glamorous do you think everybody that age was in that age was glamorous i feel like that was an inherent thing about people back in that day maybe but it's I the also, early 50s or whatever they're all decked out going out to dinner you know? but i also know that they were just very glam as a couple and they were very <sighs> poised my my mother's parents were the same. Um, and I was in so many ways. Well, I was very, very close to my mum's mum and dad. And um could have picked many photographs of me with them. But I chose this one because this is obviously way before I was there. It's also before um it's not before my my mum and my aunt were alive. It's, it's from a time that is in so many ways lost. But again, this sense that I look at this photograph and I believe it because I feel it and I feel that I'm part of it. Hmm. See, yeah. at, 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 at this separation of generations, I would feel separate from that. So that's interesting that you even see yourself even in this one. Again, I think it's maybe a a, a, a legacy also of, of story, being told stories. I'm so well versed in the stories of these people's lives. Um, of course, yeah. it's only what's been told and sure. been chosen to be told, but still, um, I've talked about my grandmother before because I talked about beauty and I know very much I grew up believing beauty to come pretty exclusively from this woman. Um, you know, everyone always said, oh, when she was younger, my goodness, what a beauty. <laughs> and there are many, many photographs testament to that depending on what you think of as beautiful i suppose but the fact is as i have trained i suppose to think of beauty on these terms and grace and poise all of your views of those things are based upon your image of your grandmother yeah that's interesting and um it's funny because my actual experience of her was when she used to wear slacks and flat shoes and none, you know, still trained me up to speak properly. And she had a, a charm school, a finishing school in the 50s in Glasgow. And um, she spoke differently to everybody else. <laughs> I don't know. I think just as a photograph to finish with, it's, it's about photographs being a living memory. So photographs kill off. Time, there are things of dusty mausoleum, I don't know. 
but at the same time in our family albums they do keep things alive we could invest in our in our sense of belief that we do you also s see it though is th that these people here are out to dinner having having a, having a classy dinner at some restaurant and smoking and drinking and doing whatever people did back then you know laughing it up not realizing or not really thinking probably at the moment that this was probably the prime of their lives and that someday they'd be gone you know what I mean? Like there's there's certain there's a certain lesson to be learned about understanding the moment you're in and where it sits inside of a larger timeline and appreciating it for for itself. You well, know? Bill, do you do that? I try to. Yeah, I do too. I think maybe it is because I spend such a lot of time with photographs. Maybe, maybe there is actually a relationship with. I don't mean a relationship with being thoughtful or anything as, as deep as that even, but simply that when you have an overview through something such as photographs, you get a very keen sense that stuff does end. Yeah. I mean, my father died at 60 years old. I am 46 years old. In some small place in my brain, I have 14 years left. Mm. Um. So, you know, two hours spent with my friend on YouTube discussing family photos. I have to appreciate these moments, you know? God, I hope the audience appreciates it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I feel it's... this has been a strange and nebulous thing this evening. Well, that's, you know, there's another title for you and me, Strange and Nebulous. <laughs> Wow, Bill Wadman, as usual, it's a pleasure. Thank you. We'll see you next week. <laughs>